Uh, hey everyone, uh, I'm happy to see you all. I hope you're feeling great. Uh, let's start with a small question. Uh, how many of you have ever had to write the same duck over and over again? Could you raise your hands? That's cool. I see a few people. We are not enough. Uh, we are not alone. Uh, but don't worry if you didn't raise your hand. This is something that usually happens in every company at a certain point, and you can definitely benefit from being prepared. That's why today we will share with you how we handled that situation in financial times in the context of ETL pipelines. Uh, but before we start, let's introduce ourselves. My name is Dravko. I'm from Sofia, Bulgaria. I'm a software engineer at Financial Times, and I have been part of the airflow adoption process in the company uh, for the last two years. And I'm Wari. Uh, <coughs> Thanks. Uh, my name is Wari. I have been part of the Airflow team in the Financial Times for the last uh, three years. Uh, most of you might not be aware, but Financial Times is not just a newspaper organization. Technology is a big and important part of the company, which continues to increase dramatically, especially over the last years. Uh, and in this context, what is the relationship between big data in general and FT? FT is a data-driven company, meaning that all the important decisions are taken based on data and statistics. And as a consequence, uh, more and more data use cases started appearing in the company, which naturally led to the need of a feature-rich and stable batching solution. We already had our custom one, but pretty soon we saw that uh, it couldn't catch up with all the requirements that we had. Uh, we decided to go for a change because of that, and here Airflow was the perfect fit. There are several reasons for that, some of them are that the software is extremely durable, stable, uh, stable and flexible, more or less out of the box. It comes with many built-in functionalities, which continue to increase all the time. And last but not least, it has a large community, which was a key point in our list of requirements. Uh, several words about our setup. Uh, we extended the original Airflow project without changing the original source code, we just added more code on, on top of it. Inside the company, the tool is developed and maintained by a dedicated team, and inside that team, we added multiple more additional features based on the requirements that FT had. And something very important is that we provide Airflow as a service to all the teams inside the organization, meaning that this dedicated team maintained the whole infrastructure and the different teams inside the company are responsible only for their own DAC code. Okay, uh, next let's briefly go over our ETL process inside the FT. Uh, this is the steps that we usually take to ingest data. Um, Initially, in the extract part, we usually receive some files in S3, although we have some use cases in uh, other sources like APIs or Kafka. Uh, then uh, we might decompress or decrypt if the file came uh, encrypted or compressed. Uh, we might do some changes in the uh, data structure, for example, uh, selecting some col columns or changing the order. We might do some role level transformations as well. As well. And finally, we validate the data uh, based on a column specification. Uh, in the load step, we uh, load the validated data to Redshift, which is what we use for our data warehouse. And finally, we send the file for long-term storage. Uh, you can see an example DAC which we used to implement this process. Um, it starts uh, in the usual way. We create a DAC object and the rest is just a sequence of operators. We build some custom ones to implement our business logic. Um, uh, this is the Redshift step and the archive on the bottom. And something to notice here is first that um, it's quite a long DAC and it takes quite a while to write it by hand. And also we used to have a lot of 
uh, hard-coded configuration inside the DAC source. So this way of doing things presented us with some challenges. The first is that um, the amount of uh, ETL pipelines we had and uh, those we wanted to migrate to Airflow meant that it would take it would have taken quite a while to do it by hand. On top of that, we also have requests for new pipelines all the time, which we need to handle as well. Um, and a specific problem we had also was that uh, we wanted to use DAC configuration, but we weren't sure how to make it uh, change based on whether on when the DAC was run in a different environment, for example, or on production or in dev. Um, while we were thinking how to solve those, uh, something that we came up was uh, we noticed that those pipelines looked more or less the same. Uh, they had a lot of shared structure and uh, we thought we could do something about that. We could automate uh, the common structure. And the main question we asked ourselves was whether we could somehow create completely dynamically uh, those DAC based uh, only from configuration. And yeah, we decided to give that a go. Uh, the first step was to design and implement a new DAC configuration system. And as Wadi mentioned, one of the requirements that we had was to be able to configure a DAC differently based on, based on the environment it is currently working on. Uh, so we made sure to handle that case. And here is how it works. For each DAC, we have one separate folder. Inside that folder, we have the regular DAC Python file. And we also have one additional config folder. Inside that folder, we have several YAML configuration files. We chose the YAML format because it's human readable and it, it was already highly adopted inside the company at that point. So inside the folder, we have one main DAC configuration file, which is expected to contain all the config, which will be more or less the same across all the Airflow environments. And also, we have one environment file, which is expected to contain only the environment-specific data. This file can add more data to the DAC config or override existing one. Let's see one example. Uh, here we can see on the left the main DAC configuration. After that, we have the configuration from the dev file. And uh, at the very right, we have the config which the DAC will receive inside the Airflow dev environment. If we take a look at the bucket, for example, we can see that it is FT local dev inside the main config but it is afterwards overridden to ftdef, and that's why it is ftdef in the final config. If you take a look at the timeout, it is not present inside the main config, but it is there inside the dev one, and that's why the DAC will receive it inside the Airflow dev environment. How do you use that inside the DAC definition? We get the DAC object from the context manager, and after that, using that DAC params property, and dot notation, we can access the final config of the DAC. This is our custom property, which we added to our extension of the Airflow DAC class. Uh, OK, so good so far, but pretty soon after we started using that config system, we saw that we have quite a lot of repeti repetitive configuration inside the DAX folder. And one of the reasons was that uh, we have some DACs which share quite a lot in common. For example, extracting data from a common source, let's say YouTube or S3 or whatever it might be. Uh, and we decided that we have to handle that somehow. And here came the idea for the nested DAC configurations. What we did is that we gave the option to have that same config folder inside every folder inside the DACs folder. And this folder will apply and affect all the subfolders below it. And the config from this parent folder can be eventually overridden by the subfolders. Uh, in this example image, we can see that the customer care data is the parent folder. It has some configuration inside it. And this configuration will be overridden by the DAC configuration, which is inside the SFDC case subfolder. Let's make it even more clear by going through some evaluation examples. This is an example of DAX folder structure with several folders, subfolders. And let's say that we want to get the final config for the DAC located in a DAC tree folder. The first step would be to get the config from the root DAX folder, 
we will merge the main config with the environment specific one. And let's say that this is our partial config. After that, we will get the config from the A1 folder. We will make the same process and we will override the partial config that we had so far. Uh, by overriding, what I mean is that we will use the same process that we used for merging the main config file with the environment specific one. Finally, we will get the config from the duct tree folder and we will override with the result from there the partial config and this will give us the final config for the DAC. If we take a look at DAC5, the process will be more or less the same, just with a different path, and the path fully depends on where the DAC is located inside the DAC's folder. Uh, so having this in mind, let's say that we have some DACs which share some configuration, DAC1 and DAC2, what we can do is that we can get this common config and put it inside the B1 folder. Um, we solved the problem with the repetitive configuration, but at this point some of our colleagues started complaining that for some of the DACs it's quite hard to know and predict the final config. And what we did is that we added a new Airflow UI custom plugin where we can see the final config for each DAC, and not only that, we can compare the configs between the different environments and see where the differences are. Okay. Once we uh, had this DAC configuration uh, mechanism, we turned on trying to automate the actual process. Firstly, we wanted to define a, a standardized common structure for the pipeline configs. You can see an example here. We have the job ID on the top, the vendor, some metadata, and the sections are uh, correspond to those steps that we showed you earlier, the ingestion step, um, here's some columns, which is just the list with uh, the name of the column, data type, the basic stuff. Um, and also you can see here in the Redshift that uh, those uh, configs that were uh, hard-coded in the DAC below, uh, before, uh, were moved to the config. Also, last thing is that we also support uh, uh, dynamic uh, templating as well. Okay, now we have that. We turned to building something called ETL Reusable DAC. The main idea behind it, uh, it would read the ETL pipeline config. Based on that, it would create the DAC object. You can see part of the definition here. We have a function called build DAC. It uh, sets some configs, and below it just creates the DAC object in the usual way. After that, what we need to do is create the operators. This happens in a separate function called build tasks. Um, firstly, we read the job config, and based on it, uh, we create the necessary steps by initializing the corresponding operators. And we only initialize uh, any operator if uh, there's a corresponding information in the config. That's why there's the if statement below. Here's an example DAC build this way. Um, you can see the directory structure on the top. We have the config folder. And in the Python file, we just have a single function code that build DAC function. We pass uh, some basic configs, and that's all that's needed. Uh, by default, we support S3, SFTP, and Kafka as uh, data inputs but we have a separate uh, way uh, to handle the different inputs. You just need to initialize an operator which would take the data, uh, in this case from an API, and then you call a build task group function which would build the, a task group with the rest of the steps and you just chain them and have the whole pipeline. Uh, once we had the reusable DAC, DAC up and running, uh, we decided to go for even more automations. And one of them was the automatic generation of SQL scripts for Redshift out of this predefined ETL config. Here in this example, we can see on the left the ETL config with the sections that we are interested in, namely the, namely the Redshift one and the columns one. And using them, we can directly generate the scripts for creating the necessary tables 
inside, inside Redshift with all the columns and the appropriate data types. Uh, with, with all of this set, I believe that now it's a good time to recap everything that we have done so far. Um, first of all, we created a new flexible DAC configuration system where we can have different DAC configuration per environment. Environment That means one and the same DAC can behave differently inside the different environments. Also now we can nest configs, which uh, gave us the ability to reduce the repetitive configuration inside our repository. Uh, regarding ETL, we created the ETL reusable DAC class, uh, which we can use to create new ETL pipelines uh, pretty fast by just specifying the configuration. Uh, we enforced the same config structure inside all the ETL pipelines, which improved our consistency and made the code more maintainable. Uh, also, with these features, uh, we removed uh, the repetitive Python DAC code regarding ETL from a DAX folder as well. And now we can easily apply changes to all the ETL pipelines at once by just updating the ETL reusable DAC class. Of course, we have to be extremely careful when we make such changes since they will apply to all the ETL pipelines. Uh, so yeah, that can be, of course, a problem. And last but not least, with this new setup, uh, we opened the door for even more automations as the one we saw with the SQL scripts. Okay, and lastly, we wanted to mention some ideas we had to automate even further uh, the process. The first uh, idea we had was that we could actually probably dispense with having to write any Python code at all. Uh, here you can see an example folder structure for some jobs. There's the parent folder configuration down below. Uh, we have some uh, DAC level configs as well. And our basic idea was that we could create a service which would uh, scan this folder. Uh, it would go over all the subfolders, it would merge the configs, and based on that, it can uh, automatically create the DAX. Next, we turned to the creation of the pipeline config itself. Uh, the way we receive uh, requests for new pipelines in DFT is usually uh, as a data contract, which comes in a predefined spreadsheet format. And uh, since we know uh, the, uh, the spreadsheet format, uh, we thought it, we could probably create a service which would parse that automatically and uh, create the pipeline config. And further, we thought we could probably dispense with the spreadsheet completely as well and to replace it with uh, an Airflow UI plugin which would present you with a form for creating a new pipeline uh, request this could then be converted to the pipeline config, and we could also probably automatically raise that in our DAX repo as a PR. So uh, having said all that, I think we answered the question that we posed earlier, uh, and we can write ETL DAX uh, completely from configuration, and this allows us, allows us to automate further parts of the pipeline as well. Thank you very much, and any questions? Any questions to Zdravko and Vladi? If not, oh, okay. Hi, uh, thanks um, for the talk. Um, my question has to do with when do you decide to actually automate a DAG, specifically the tasks? Because I imagine the amount of effort to automate some tasks will probably be greater than just writing it if it's a one-time DAG. So just can you walk me through that thought process? Uh, well, of course, it took some time for us to decide whether to go and step further and uh, implement this. Uh, in fact, as Wadi mentioned, we had quite a lot of uh, legacy pipelines to migrate to Airflow. The other thing was that uh, uh, we have, let's say, quite a lot of colleagues which are not so used to Python, uh, and we wanted to um, make their life easier. And just by filling some configuration, uh, they can uh, have their pipeline inside Airflow. The other thing is that we continue 
uh, to, to receive requests for new pipelines all the time. And without further improvement that uh, Vladi mentioned, uh, in the future we can just let them send them the link to the Airflow UI, they can fill some things and they will see their pipeline inside Airflow, which will save us some time. Yeah. I have another question. So, uh, because uh, right now what you are telling to your internal users, like use config and uh, the DAC will be generated uh, for you. So, is it really like everybody using this approach or you still have some small portion of, or group of users who still want to implement their own DACs because uh, this model of con con like automated uh, translation of the config to the DAC doesn't work for them? Uh, yeah, that's in fact a good question. Uh, this is an additional feature on top of all the Airflow functionalities, meaning that, that it's not mandatory to be used. In fact, we have quite a lot of other teams which don't have ETL pipelines at all. They just, just have other pipelines. Uh, this is uh, only for the ETL pipelines. And uh, I mean, we strive to use it all the time for consistency purposes. But if there are some specific corner use case, of course, uh, we can skip it. Okay, so so people have still the, the, the choice. Okay. I don't know whether. To, okay, maybe this makes still works. Um, so, I, I I think similar to what the other um, questioner asked, like, have you seen any impact from from having this configurable DAG? That would be maybe, um, you, you mentioned that you have none, uh, people who are not used to using Python, but do you have some sort of measure of like, okay, we've gotten this much value out of this configurable DAG um, that we wouldn't have gotten otherwise? Uh, we have mostly noticed it during the migration from our legacy solution, which happens at the moment. Um, initially, we started with uh, the older uh, way of doing it, which was to write the DAC completely by hand, and it was completely obvious that it, this took a lot more time. And um, I think the most important part that the automation allowed us to do is to uh, create some tools around the process, which would uh, help a lot with the author of the DAC. Um, so we figured out a way to uh, converts the configuration for the jobs which would which used to run on the legacy uh, to to the new configuration, so this uh, made the whole uh, step completely almost can be done in half an hour. Uh, another question: So, if someone produced a config and the duck was uh, generated, who is responsible for making sure that this duck works? Is this your team or? the author of the config? Uh, in general, we just provide the Airflow as a service to the other teams. So we try to leave this responsibility with the DAG author. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 